Hello, everyone. I'm Olympia. Thank you for being here with me in this wonderful place called Lights Out Library. And I have a great story to tell you. For tonight, we have prepared stories that will take us to ancient archaeological sites around the world. First, we will travel to Stonehenge in England. We will explore what is known or can be presumed about it, as well as the legends and beliefs that have gravitated around it for centuries. And I will tell you about megalith builders in prehistoric Europe. For another aspect of the Neolithic period, we will visit one of the oldest and largest Neolithic sites in Europe, Scarbray, in the extreme north of Scotland on the windy Orkney Islands. We will walk among the stone houses of a village that was populated 5,000 years ago, even before Stonehenge or the pyramids of Egypt were built. As always, you do not need to watch the video to follow along. If you wish to, you may close your eyes and forget about any worries as we embark on this adventure together. If you are so kind, please subscribe to my channel and click the like button. This helps support the channel and limits ads as much as possible. Please also follow us on Facebook for announcements. If you fall asleep and wish to resume the video later or to jump directly to a particular part of the story, timestamps are listed in the description as well as pinned in the first comment. Also below you will find links to different streaming options like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Amazon Music. But before we begin, assume a comfortable position. Take a long, deep, relaxing breath. And when you exhale, release the tension in your shoulders. Release the tension in your facial muscles, too. And allow the sound of my voice to guide you through this journey. And our first stop is in the green English countryside. Let's go to Stonehenge. You know what Stonehenge looks like. It's an iconic monument. The large ring of standing stones, or more accurately, several rings. The stones are huge. Some of them measure more than four meters. That is more than 13 feet. And they weigh up to 50 tons. These standing stones are called megaliths. The term derives from ancient Greek, megas, means great or large, and lithos, means stone. We'll come back to megaliths in a minute because they are the most visible remains of the Neolithic and Bronze Age periods in Europe, and there are many megalithic sites. Stonehenge may be the most spectacular and famous, but there are over 35,000 megaliths in Europe alone, from Scandinavia in the north to the Mediterranean Sea in the south. Stonehenge is not an isolated structure. It is surrounded by many more, less visible works, especially ancient tombs called tumuli. We are going to explore this. The understanding of Stonehenge, when it was built, by whom and why, has progressed enormously since the 20th century, but it remains rather mysterious. There are many different theories about it, which is yet another thing we need to discuss tonight. Was it a temple, a place for ceremonies, an astronomical observatory? The truth is, there are few certainties, and it could have been several of these things over millennia because long after its builders were gone, Stonehenge continued to be used to fascinate and to raise questions. 
So let's take one thing at a time and return to the origins, when the monument started to be built. This was around 5,000 years ago, 3,000 B.C., about the same time when early civilizations in Mesopotamia, China, and Egypt appeared. Stonehenge was built and rearranged several times over a period of 1,500 years by different peoples. The earliest ones were probably from a group of cultures referred to as the Windmill Hill Peoples, around 3000 B.C. These people practice a semi-nomadic lifestyle during the Neolithic, the New Agriculture. They raised cattle, but they were not entirely sedentary. They lived during a period of transition between hunters and gatherers and agrarian societies. Doing a bit of both, and they built structures, especially tombs. They built, or more precisely, they dug, large circular furrows, like trenches or hilltop enclosures, and they also created collective tombs. They have left remains in different locations in England, and it seems their structures show a taste for symmetry and circles. Now, how do we know it was around 3000 B.C.? mainly thanks to radiocarbon dating. Ancient tools and other remains were found in trenches, not only at Stonehenge, but also at different sites, pointing to approximately the same period of time, 5,000 years ago. But what the Windmill Hill peoples made in Stonehenge is a trace of an external ring. There were probably no stones involved yet, and they dug a circular trench, not continuous, but rather a series of small rectangular trenches that constitute a wide circle. There have been many hypotheses over the centuries about who built Stonehenge. The Celts, the Romans, the Saxons, and even the Greeks. This includes more exotic ones like people from Atlantis or aliens. The most popular of these beliefs is that the Celts built it as a sanctuary or a sacred place for their druids to gather, and this theory made sense in the 19th century. The Celts were some of the most ancient known inhabitants of England and they had a culture and technical knowledge that seemed compatible with the construction of Stonehenge. But the problem is that there were no Celts in Britain or anywhere else in 3000 BC. The Celts arrived much later. They are first and foremost a linguistic group, sharing similar cultural traits and descending from waves of Indo-European peoples. These Indo-European peoples came probably from a large region north of the Caucasus and in Ukraine, from which they spread in many directions, to the north of India, to Persia, and almost all of Europe over centuries and centuries. They didn't find empty land where they arrived in these regions. They probably mixed with the locals, or replaced them or they shared space. It's hard to know exactly how things unfolded in every region. For example, in Italy, they cohabitated with Italic tribes that founded the city of Rome, where the Indo-European peoples, the Etruscans who lived north of Rome in central Italy, were very probably not based on their language. In the west of Europe, along the Atlantic Ocean, and in Central Europe, Celtic culture terminated in the first millennium BC. 
This was the time of the Druids, that is to say, long after the building of Stonehenge. To the Celts, in fact, the builders of Stonehenge were as ancient as the Romans are to us. It is likely that the Celts used the site, though, but they didn't build it. And these Windmill Hill peoples who started working on the monument were certainly way less technologically advanced. They hadn't discovered metallurgy yet and were living in the period called the Neolithic. Once again, a word coined from ancient Greek. Neo meaning new and lithic meaning stone. New because around 12,000 years ago, the first known developments in farming appeared in the Near East first, before multiplying in other parts of the world. And archaeologists observed a number of new cultural characteristics coming with it. Early pottery, the use of crops, domesticated animals, and at that time, Stone tools reached new levels of effectiveness. You know that the Stone Age as a whole is defined as the period when humans made tools out of stone. The earliest tools were barely distinguishable from regular rocks. They looked very basic. And then over thousands and thousands of years, they became more refined with more and more precision work put into carving them. By the Neolithic, stone tools had diversified for many different uses. There were knives and arrowheads, spearheads and axes and scrapers, and they were sharper, stronger, and more efficient than ever. The only way to do better was to use another material, metal. And when metal replaced stones, humans entered the Bronze Age. So the Neolithic is a stage of developments rather than a period that would work for all human societies. In Northern Europe, the Neolithic lasted until about 1700 BC, long after Mesopotamia or Egypt. And in certain remote parts of the world, the Neolithic lasted until European contact in modern times. European explorers met peoples who hadn't developed metallurgy, so the Windmill Hill peoples lived during the Neolithic, and they didn't have metal. But it doesn't mean they didn't build. Actually, the oldest stone construction tradition that we know of in the world, is not from early civilizations in the Middle East, India, or China, but it is in the Neolithic societies, especially in Western Europe, in the 5th and 4th millennium BC. That is to say, more than 6,000 years ago. In Portugal, Spain, France, and a bit later in the British Isles and the south of Scandinavia. Neolithic people built chamber tombs, also known as long burrows or tumuli. And as I told you at the beginning, Stonehenge is not isolated in the middle of the countryside. The area was populated for thousands of years, and Stonehenge is surrounded by the highest concentration in Britain of Neolithic structures. So what is a tumulus? Tumuli may be found throughout much of the world. So it seems it is a kind of monument that tends to appear spontaneously in Neolithic societies, maybe because it is simple. A tumulus mound of earth and stones, often raised over a grave or even several graves, but not always. In Western Europe, they are often called long burrows, and there are thousands of them that have been excavated. They contain one or several chambers. The chambers may be dug underground or built above ground with standing stones. 
the length of such monuments reveal a degree of social organization because they required the cooperation of different individuals over a period of time, and they would have represented an investment in time and resources. We are considering societies that were not only focused on surviving. Apart from earth, other materials were used, like timber and stone, apparently depending on the availability of building materials in the area where they were built. Archaeologists are still debating their purpose. One theory is that they were religious sites may be dedicated to the veneration of ancestors, or they could have been territorial markers. They appeared in societies that were transitioning towards farming and a more sedentary life. So maybe they delineated areas controlled by different communities. But very often they were also graves where one or several persons were buried probably persons of some importance, which also suggests that there was a social hierarchy in place within the groups that built them. There are long burrows in many different kinds of environments, some in wooden areas where they remained hidden, and others in visible locations like on hilltops. So it is difficult to know exactly what the intention was, Maybe they had different purposes. Many tumuli used large stone blocks, megaliths, without mortar. The structure is called megalithic when it is made of such rocks just standing near each other or put on top of each other without mortar. Stonehenge is an archetypal megalithic structure. There are different types of megaliths in Western Europe. A single upright stone is called a menhir, and other single stones placed horizontally above a burial chamber are called capstones. There are also more elaborate multiple stone structures. Stones may be placed in alignments with an intention to place them in relation to each other. One such alignment is the Karnak site in Brittany, France. The Karnak stones are a collection of more than 3,000 standing stones. It is the largest concentration of megaliths in the world, and it includes rows or alignments of stones, as well as other structured tumuli and single menhirs. Karnak was built probably around 3300 B.C., a few centuries before the first stones were erected at Stonehenge. And like for Stonehenge, a lot of posterior legends appeared around Karnak. Like a Christian myth, for example, which said the stones were pagan soldiers who were in pursuit of the Pope, and they were turned into stones. Brittany also has a local version of Arthurian legends, and another tradition claims that the stones are perfectly aligned because they were a Roman legion turned to stone by Merlin. Apart from alignments, another type of megalithic structure is stone circles. When we take a closer look at the various parts of Stonehenge, we will see that it contains such a circle. But there are other examples in the Arabs and in Poland and France and in Britain, like the Rollwright Stones of Oxfordshire. The Rollwright Stones are a complex of three monuments from different periods, from the 4th to the 2nd millennium BC. One of them is called the Kingsmen, from the late Neolithic. The Rollwright stones also compromise a dolmen, which is a form created by placing a large capstone on two or more support stones. It creates a sort of artificial megalithic cave with a chamber that was often used as a tomb. 
The oldest known megalithic construction in the world was found in Turkey, and it was dated from even before the Neolithic. In the intermediary period of the Stone Age called Mesolithic, it was dated from the 10th millennium BC, 12,000 years ago, and that makes it probably the oldest known religious structure in the world. Megalithic remains multiplied in Europe starting around 5000 BC. The oldest ones are in Portugal. From there, they expanded to Spain, France, from around 4000 BC to Britain and Ireland. And then, starting from 3000 BC, they are everywhere in Western Europe. So, as old as Stonehenge is, it was preceded by a lot of megalithic structures that were generally simpler. In particular, they didn't have the type of gates that are distinctive of Stonehenge. But Stonehenge happened in the middle or late period of megalithic construction in Europe. Substructures are several centuries more ancient and the creation of monuments in the area around Stonehenge is also anterior to Stonehenge itself. The oldest traces of occupation discovered nearby date back to the Mesolithic from 8000 BC. One mile from Stonehenge, so very close, there is a spring called Blickmead and its particularity is that its temperature is constant all year round. It never freezes. This was an attractive spot for men from the Stone Age, a spring that provides water consistently and signs of occupation from 10,000 to 6,000 years ago have been discovered near the spring. Another hypothesis is that the spring could have been the reason that inspired Stonehenge. Rare algae are living in the spring and cause stones taking out from it to turn bright red within a few hours when they are taken out of the water. This may have seemed magical and remarkable at least to prehistoric men, and that could explain a spiritual or magical significance attributed to the area. However, it is only thousands of years later, that the windmill hill people traced the first circle. This circle is the initial oldest part of the monument, and they also built a low bank along the inner side of the circle using chalk they had taken from the digging of the ditch. There were two openings along the circle, a large entrance to the northeast and a smaller one to the south. This enclosure remained as such for centuries, probably used by the inhabitants with no further construction. The exact purpose of this enclosure is not precisely known, but it must have had a religious or sacred significance because inside the ditch they placed stone tools lint tools and bones of deer and oxen that were discovered at the bottom. Interestingly, radiocarbon dating indicates that these bones are much older than the picks used to dig the ditch, suggesting that they must have looked after them for a long time before burying them. Perhaps these bones were just left at the bottom of the ditch and they were progressively buried when the ditch started to fill up. Along the circle, they also excavated more than 50 pits, which may have contained standing timbers. So, at some point around 3000 BC, Stonehenge might have looked like a timber circle, but this isn't sure because there are no remains of them, and these pits. The cremated remains of individuals were found, including men, women, and children. We don't know if they were built here to be honored, to look after the circle, to be protected by it, 
or if they were sacrificed for an unknown reason. Other bits discovered inside the circle indicate the possibility of more timber inside, at the entrance, and at various locations within the ring. This outer circle, which still stands today, is quite large. It measures about 360 feet in diameter. Four centuries later, around 2600 BC, the builders abandoned timber and replaced it with stone, beginning to give Stonehenge the appearance we know nowadays. They used blue stones from Pembrokeshire in Wales, which is almost incredible because the quarries are 150 miles away from Stonehenge. Traces of human quarrying of exactly similar rocks in Pembrokeshire tend to prove that they did it. It is believed that they brought the stones by lifting them on rows of logs so that they could make them roll thousands of miles to the site. It is also likely that stones, smaller stones, from other monuments were taken to build Stonehenge. But still, this is an astonishing accomplishment that required a lot of planning. One such stone brought to the site around 2600 BC is called the Altar Stone. We don't know whether it really was an altar, but we will look at the inside of Stonehenge later. During the same period, the northeastern entrance, the larger of the two, was widened, and as a result it became aligned with the direction of the midsummer sunrise and midwinter sunset. This is one element that strongly suggests there was an astronomical dimension to Stonehenge, at least from this point. It also shows that it was built in relation to the wider world and not just as a monument centered on itself. Another stone from the same period placed outside the entrance is the heel stone, and this one is really impressive. It weighs about 35 tons and rises 4.7 meters little over 15 feet, above the ground, almost the height of a two-story house. This heel stone stands within Stonehenge Avenue, which measures nearly three kilometers, and that's almost two miles, and connects the entrance to the River Avon. This avenue was built in the same period, around 2600 B.C., it consists of parallel ditches and construction intensified around 2600 B.C., lasting until 1600 B.C. This means that it took 15 centuries to build from 3100 B.C. when the Windmill Hill people traced the first circle to 1600 B.C. approximately. This is about the same time difference as between us and the fall of the Roman Empire, and over this very long period of time, most of the stones were brought and rearranged several times, but not by the initial builders. You remember that the initial enclosure was traced by the Windmill Hill peoples, but it isn't clear precisely when, but their trace was lost in the 3rd millennium B.C. By 2000 B.C., the new inhabitants of the area were the Beaker people, or the Beaker folk, who arrived to the continent with different cultural characteristics compared to the predecessors. They buried their dead with little pottery drinking cups, or beakers. This is where their name comes from and their weapons. They also seem to pay more attention to burying their dead individually. Instead of having large mass graves, they multiplied smaller individual tombs and tumuli. 
Additionally, their social structures were believed to be more complex than their predecessors, and they had empirical knowledge of mathematical concepts. It is believed that they worshipped the sun. Various archaeologists believe that they are the ones who aligned Stonehenge with solar events like summer and winter solstices. The Beaker peoples were at the junction of the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, and they began introducing metal implements. Like their predecessors, they were a cultural group. Probably several tribes with little cultural variations between them. The Wessex people, who arrived later, were a final culture to the Stonehenge. By the middle of the second millennium BC, around the time ancient Egypt was near its peak, and there were still centuries more to go before the appearance of civilizations in Europe with cities or even a writing system. But the Wessex people were quite advanced at the time. They practiced trade, mastered bronze metallurgy, and produced many more items compared to the cultures before them. This indicates an elevation in their standards of living. It is believed that they are the ones who gave Stonehenge its final touch. But returning to the construction, one of the most famous features of Stonehenge is a ring of upright stones capped by a continuous line of lintels. This was erected in the center of the site by the middle of the third millennium. The upright stones are massive, weighing up to 25 tons each, and may come from another quarry closer to Stonehenge, 25 miles away. The lintels are not just put above the stones randomly. The upright stones are carved and fitted to one another, using a method called pen and groove joint, which is used in parquetry, for example, when different boards are fitted to one another by the edge. And the lintel stones are also slightly curved to smooth the circular appearance of the monument. Inside the circle stood even bigger structures, Five stone gates made of two upright stones and one lintel. They are placed to form a sort of horseshoe, with the opening of the horseshoe oriented towards the entrance. But Stonehenge kept changing its appearance over the centuries, and stones were arranged several different times before they took their final position. By 2000 BC, it is likely that the stone ring, which was 33 meters in diameter, that is 110 feet, was entirely complete, closed and surrounded entirely by the horseshoe of higher gates or doors. But in the last phase, the northeastern section of the ring was removed, so instead of a ring, it became a second larger horseshoe also oriented towards the sunrise in the summer and sunset in the winter. There are carvings on various stones, probably from the late period, and it seems that after 1600 BC, the monument was no longer rearranged or extended with new stones. Over the centuries, new waves of migrants or invaders reached England. The Celtic culture dominated the first millennium BC. Then came the Roman Empire. Germanic tribes like the Saxons and the Normans in the Middle Ages. And Stonehenge was obviously not forgotten because it's unmissable. And it developed a life of its own over the centuries, being adapted and studied by different groups. None of the cultures that built it had a writing system, so there is no testimony available. And the only way to learn about it is to study the site itself, the peoples who built it, and other megalithic structures. 
to the followers of this Neolithic and Bronze Age builders, Stonehenge must have appeared extraordinarily impressive. To the Celts, who didn't have a writing system either, and lived there a thousand years after the end of the construction, it must have looked like remains left by the gods. The Celts never developed a monumental stone architecture of that kind. On many counts, they were more advanced than their predecessors in Britain and Ireland, but their culture didn't care that much for spectacular stone monuments. The idea that Druids, the Celtic priests, were the creators of Stonehenge appeared in the modern period. Initially, it was a hypothesis from the first scholars who studied the monument. It became very popular. And it is a widespread belief that Stonehenge has something to do with the Druids. Since radiocarbon tests have proven that it is way more ancient, we know that it was not a Druid site, but it remains associated with the Celts in popular culture. However, it is also likely based on remains found at the site that Druids did indeed use Stonehenge, at least occasionally. They generally worshipped in forest or marshes, but they would have turned Stonehenge into a temple of worship and sacrifice. There is a new pagan religion of modern Druids that congregates at Stonehenge on the summer solstice. After the Celts, folklore and legends appeared around the monument. For example, in the story about Arthurian legends, a book from the 12th century called The History of Kings of Britain by Geoffrey Monmouth is one of the texts that contributed to elaborating Arthur in mythology and literature in the Middle Ages, and it attributed the building of Stonehenge to Merlin the Wizard. Another unrelated legend from the Saxons says that Stonehenge was built by a Saxon king in the 5th century AD to show his remorse because he would have invited enemy warriors to the site for a feast and then, as they were defenseless, he would have ordered his men to draw their weapons from concealment and fall upon the guests killing more than 400 of them. The site started to be studied in the 17th century. This was the moment when the association with the Druids began, and research intensified with a lot of new major discoveries in the 20th century and, until recently, thanks to excavations. This is how the history of the building was gradually uncovered and became the basis for most of the theories we talked about regarding the building periods and the people who worked on the site. The introduction of radiocarbon tests was very important because it finally revealed how ancient Stonehenge really was. A lot of remains have been found, including charcoal, bones, tools, and human remains from different periods. I told you about the remains that the early builders left all around the original circle. Another body was discovered in 1978, the Stonehenge Archer. It is the body of a Bronze Age man who died around 2300 BC. During a time of active construction on the site, he is known as the archer because flint arrowheads were buried with him, and several of them were located in the skeleton's bones, suggesting that the man was killed by arrows. We don't know the significance of his burial, but this raises the question of the function or functions of Stonehenge for the various cultures that built and used it. There are clues, such as the alignment with the sun at the solstices, 
and the apparently sacred or funerary purpose of the site with animal and human remains buried there. However, none of this is very precise, and various theories coexist about what Stonehenge was really about. Let's take a look at them, shall we? There were theories by various authors suggesting that supernatural methods were used to move the stones based on the assumption that the stones would have been impossible to move or that the builders must have had access to technologies that were a lot more advanced. However, these are not ideas that the scientific community takes seriously. They appear completely out of the scope of peer reviews and sometimes make their way to the public, where they exist because they couldn't survive within the scientific community, where evidence needs to be discussed and exposed. In any case, there were tests made to check whether such heavy stones, some of them weighing 50 tons, could be transported and lifted to an upright position? The answer is yes. With a group of people and techniques that were available to the Neolithic and Bronze Age men, like logs placed under stones to make them roll, and then sheer legs to lift them, it worked. Another theory for transport is the use of a kind of sleigh running on a track greased with animal fat. So the construction itself is absolutely an impressive testimony to the ingenuity of the builders, but it works technically. This is not that mysterious. What is harder to know is the function of Stonehenge. Traditional explanations are an astronomical observatory or a religious site, or both at the same time and these theories seem to make a lot more sense. But there are others, too. One theory that is not incompatible with others is that Stonehenge was a place of healing, like a Neolithic equivalent to miraculous pilgrimage places like Lod nowadays. This hypothesis is based on the high number of tombs in the area and the evidence of trauma or deformity in some of the bodies. Additionally, the fact that there are people buried around Stonehenge who came from other parts of Europe, as revealed by isotope analysis of their remains, there was at least one teenage boy raised near the Mediterranean Sea, a man from Germany and several from Wales or France. One characteristic of the blue stones on the site, and one that was discovered recently, is that they have unusual acoustic properties. When they are struck, they respond with a loud noise. These properties could explain why they were brought from as far as Wales when there were quarries available closer. Maybe these acoustic properties led people to believe that the stones were magical and had healing properties. It is also possible that Stonehenge was just a part of a larger ritual landscape with the avenue and its connection to the river haven. This complex may have created a ritual passage from the world of the living to the world of the dead and the journey along it would have been a way of celebrating past ancestors. Yet another hypothesis is that Stonehenge was built as a symbol of unity and peace because, at the time of its construction, Neolithic cultures in Britain were going through a period of communication and unification. So, as you can see, the study of Stonehenge has brought a lot of information. It has also opened new questions, and the place retains many of its mysteries. But men from the Neolithic didn't just leave megaliths and tombs behind them as they transitioned 
from a nomadic to a sedentary lifestyle. They sometimes built villages in stone. And now we're going to head north, to the north of Scotland, and visit one of the most extraordinary Neolithic sites in the world, Scarabray. To the extreme north of Scotland, there is a small archipelago called Orkney, the Orkney Islands. They are just 10 miles off the coast of Great Britain, and their proximity made them easy to access from the mainland for early inhabitants of Scotland. The Orkney Islands have about 70 different islands, and on the main one, long before the first stones were brought to Stonehenge, the Neolithic community built a stone settlement, a village that remains very well preserved 5,000 years later. There were probably good reasons to settle on the Orkney Islands. They are far north, but the climate was relatively mild thanks to the Gulf Stream. It was also probably rather safe in the 4th millennium B.C. Invaders could have only come from the south, from Scotland, and it probably felt like Orkney was at the end of the world to its inhabitants. There were no forests and little wood available, but on the other hand, they could fish and hunt on an island that was large enough to support a small community of a few dozen people. The first traces of occupation date back to 3180 BC. One or two centuries before the initial circle of Stonehenge was traced by Windmill Hill people, and what explains the state of Scarbray is that the village was abandoned 700 years later around 2500 B.C., and was subsequently buried in the sand. It was excavated thousands of years later. For this reason, it has been compared to Pompeii. Its state of preservation is extraordinary for a site older than Stonehenge, or even the Egyptian pyramids. The site was initially rediscovered in 1850, after a big storm removed enough sand to reveal the village's outline. The village had a number of small houses without roofs. The site remained unstudied and unprotected for a long time, making it vulnerable to thefts and storms that threatened its destruction. In the 1920s, Efforts were made to secure and investigate the site. Initially, it was believed that the village belonged to the first millennium B.C., around 500 B.C., which made it important but not extraordinary, as there were plenty of villages from the Celtic period. The reality appeared in the 1970s. Radiocarbon tests revealed that Scarabray dated back to the 4th and 3rd millennia B.C. and was abandoned around 2500 B.C. This discovery changed the understanding of the site. It is believed that the changing climate, becoming colder and wetter, led to the burial of the village in sand and the abandonment of the area. Many valuable artifacts were left behind. While some people imagined that the village was suddenly abandoned due to a disaster like in Pompeii, many researchers disagree with this view. Research indicates that the settlement was gradually buried over several centuries. So there is no doubt the village was abandoned quickly, but we don't know why. It could be anything from an attack that would have left their houses untouched, 
or the whole population dying while they were outside. No one can tell. At this point, a cluster of eight houses has been excavated, but there were more structures that have been lost to sea erosion. The village is now very close to the sea, but it was further from it when it was inhabited. Other structures are still buried and have been left underground, like Pompeii. This ensures that they remain preserved. So what do we know about the inhabitants of Scarabray? This was the Neolithic period as discussed before, which means their tools were made of stone and other non-metallic materials. They had wood, bone, and also used animal fur and skin, ivory, clay was used for pottery. The houses they built were built into the ground, and they used earth sheltering. This is to say they were sunk into the ground like hobbit houses. But this kind of earth sheltering existed in many different countries and can be found in Iceland and Ireland. It provides protection against the wind and the cold. The winters in Orkney were cold, and the wind was also a fact of life. It blows constantly, and storms were frequent. The houses that are half buried and covered in earth are very stable and also well insulated even though the inside may be a bit dark when there are no windows. Each house was relatively small, measuring around 40 square meters, which is 430 square feet, and consisted of a single square room with a stone hearth for heating and cooking. There was close to no wood in Scarabray, and it isn't clear what people used as fuel. This is also probably the reason why the village was built with stone and left such remains. Neolithic villages were almost always built with wood in other parts of Europe, and this is why houses left only traces. So for fuel, they may have used turf, or driftwood, or maybe even dried seaweed. Not only were the walls made of stone, but they also had pieces of furniture. They had cupboards and seats, storage boxes and beds, and the village had a draining system including primitive toilets in dwelling. The community was very small, maybe around 50 individuals at any time, and apparently it was very egalitarian too because seven of the eight houses had exactly the same furniture in the same place. It suggests that the inside arrangement of houses had to follow very strict and specific rules. The eight house, however, is different. It doesn't have storage space or a dresser like the others, and instead plenty of fragments of bone and flint were found. This suggests it was used as a place to make tools, a workshop for the community, maybe. The inhabitants raised cattle. It is believed that they didn't practice agriculture, but maybe they did to a small extent, because seeds of barley were discovered on the site. Also, the remains indicate that they ate a lot of seafood, which makes sense. Artifacts and symbols found at Scarbray also shed light on their lifestyle and the richness of their mental world. There are symbols carved into stone lintels and doorposts, and the symbols resemble an early form of runic writing. This was most probably not a writing system and the symbols had a meaning. 
they revealed a degree of conceptualization and aesthetics in this community. Besides utilitarian tools like shovels or knives, they also had a production of ornaments made of bone, artifacts, beads, or pins. They probably painted their bodies too, a tradition that was widespread for centuries in Britain until the Roman conquest. They could have used red ochre, which was found in lumps in the village. Life was probably harsh compared to our modern lifestyle. But by the standards of the European Neolithic, it seems Scarabray was a good place to live. The level of comfort and the longevity of the settlement that lasted for tens of generations indicate that they had found a way of living that worked and they made the best out of the Neolithic technologies and their environment. Well, we've come to the end of our little journey tonight. I hope you enjoyed this adventure, and I invite you, as always, to discover and learn more. Now you can let go and sleep. And until we meet again, good night. Sleep well.